Ladies and gentlemen, did the Apostle Paul tell women to shut up in church? Did he tell them that they must keep silent? Or did later church fathers add this into the text and put this in the mouth of Paul? Could there be a little bit of both going on, but maybe we just haven't understood the guy? Well, stay tuned. I'll be talking to a PhD today who has an opinion on this. We take a deep dive. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Lambert. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Joseph A.P. Wilson is joining us today, and we're going to talk about Paul. But before we do, you've never met the gentleman. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself? What are your What are your specialties, if you will? And then we'll get right into Paul. Thank you very much. I am not a specialist in the study of Paul. I am a, an, I'm an anthropologist and I'm a religion scholar. Um, and I have a number of different areas that I've worked in uh, over the years. I have um, too many degrees and too many jobs. <laughs> but um, at, this area of research of mine has come back into my life after a long time. When I was uh, back in the days when I was an undergraduate at Kent State, my mentor um, was David W. Odell Scott, who is still at, at, Kent State today. He's a, a great guy. And he is the um, person who, one of the modern um, proponents of what we call the quotation refutation hypothesis pertaining to the really infamously misogynistic passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And so I have recently noticed the debate cropping back up into the literature, and I've decided to work on uh, a, publica a publication in progress, which I won't talk too much about the details of. But I, I'm I'm here to you with you today to talk about sort of my my ongoing research on this problem of when why Paul sounds like he's saying something incredibly sexist when most. Critical scholars believe that Paul was on the other side of that, um, the debate about women's roles in the early church. Because the, you know, female ordination is not a topic that just came up like yesterday. Right. It, it was, it's been something that's been argued about since the very beginning within Christianity. And the earliest Christian texts we have show that there was a hot debate over whether women should be allowed to play a major role in the leadership of early Christianity. And mm -hmm. so my, my position and the position of most critical scholars of Paul is that Paul was firmly on the, yes, women are leaders in the church. He was on that side. But then among the um, those scholars, there is a debate about the text itself. Is the text, the original, um, we're talking about, to clarify for your, your, your audience, there are uh, about half the epistles of Paul are recognized to be actually Paul's writing. The other half are often regarded as uh, deuteropauline or like written in his name by later Christians who were trying to like usurp his authority, take Paul's authority and use it as a way of, of pushing their agenda, mm -hmm. right, in the Christian mm -hmm. church. So if you, if you limit your discussion to just what we everyone agrees Paul actually wrote, then there's a debate about to what extent that has been modified, right, by later editors. Right. How have editors carved it up and tried to make it make it um, say something uh, about women, right? Versus versus those people who say, oh, it might be misinterpreted. And so I come down on the misinterpretation line. I say that people are misreading. The passage in First Corinthians, if you stick to the canonical text and read it correctly, then you recognize it as supporting Paul's um, egalitarianism, his belief that women should be leaders and not supporting the, alt the opposite side that women are supposed to sit down and shut up. Yeah, so there's that famous passage where it's like women should not speak in a church. Right. And now then, if you could take us through that just briefly as we lead right. into where really you're going to take an elbow in the road a little bit compared to other scholarship. Tell right. us what that argument is for our audience. Most of the people have heard about it, but maybe this recap from you might help refresh their memory. All right. So um, 
I will read for you the passage itself, 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 and 35. Uh, we're going to use the Revised Standard Version. The women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, even as the law says. If there is anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. That's the citation. People who who people who people are against female ordination can just cite that, throw it out there, but they have to chop it out. They have to cut it out of the, path, the, 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 the surrounding text and throw it at you in isolation because if they read a good translation of the next passage, verse 36 in Greek, it is, pause, <clears throat> what? Did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only ones it has reached? And the pronouns in Greek are gendered. So you know that verses 34 and 35 are addressing women. But mm. the pronouns in verses third in verse 36 are masculine. The plural pronoun in verse 36 is a masculine plural, plural pronoun. So when you read it in the original Greek, <laughs> the <laughs> audience changes. It's now hold on. Now, now hold on. Complementarians, traditionalists, and fundamentalists will say, well, just like in English, Greek, Greek masculine can be neutral. Right. They're right. 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 So yeah. in other words, they're saying they're still criticizing women. Yeah. Okay. I suppose you could, but you, there are also feminine pronouns. But that the you, context you, itself is what he's saying. Itself, he's like, are yeah, you the yeah, only yeah, yeah. ones who've actually had the word yeah, of God reach you? They've, yeah. They've, the, 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 the text now has expanded the pronoun reference to include men. Right. Where And in Greek, that means there's at least one man in that audience now. Right. Whereas before, in, in English, when we use gender-neutral pronouns in English, we there is you can assume nothing about the gender of the audience. You could use gender-neutral pronouns to refer to entirely female audience, entirely male audience, whatever. There's no indication. Yeah. In the even Greek even news, today, we'll say things sometimes like, "I'll go, how you doing, guys." And I'm right. talking to a group of girls, and we just right. say things like that. So, right, and 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 yeah. that's sort of the that's sort of the argument that people who say that verse 36. So the the traditional complementarian reading is that verse 30 verse 36 is chastising the Corinthians for lenience and allowing their women to speak, but it right. do, it's ungrammatical. It doesn't work. So there's a there's a there's something called a heta. It's a little tiny particle. It's a disjunctive particle of separation. It occurs in in that verse 36 passage twice. And it's the what or construction. Like the what? Is this <laughs> it or is that it? And elsewhere in the same letter, Paul uses that when he's chastising the Corinthians for their errors. But the question is, is he talking to the men who are speaking in the previous passage? Or is he talking to the about the women who are, who are not shutting up like they're supposed to? It's, it requires that you twist the, the grammar to get it to mean the conventional understanding. So how did the historical church, how did the ancient church make it so that it was clear that the women were actually supposed to shut up? Because how, we have evidence that the early church fathers didn't read it that way. Right. How do we know this? Because, well, first of all, there's no evidence of any manuscripts missing this package, passage. So some people say that the entire thing is an interpolation. Some people say that that forgery, that, that are the editors copying some other stuff attributed to Paul, like the passage in 1 Timothy. There's a parallel passage in 1 Timothy, which mm -hmm. very few people would regard as pa really Paul. They would say that that's a forgery written in Paul's name. But the passage in 1 Timothy, some people say that that has been retrojected back into this to Corinthians. So like somebody had a manuscript of 1 Timothy, was inspired by the presence of this similar passage in that manuscript and then chunked it in there to make mm -hmm. Paul say these things because it seems kind of out of place. So that's a very common view among my fellow scholars who are egalitarian Paulists, who believe that Paul supported women's ordination. Right. And that's one way to answer it. it but I do want to mention, you. before you get into that, just right. to make the point, what modern Christians are doing with this passage, um, and, and you know the whole point is to get women to shut up, 
I think is the actual problem of what Paul's trying to address in the Corinthian right. church. So, so for anyone who's watching, Paul's trying to correct, according to what Joseph's saying here, he's trying to say, no, don't tell them to shut up. Do you think you're the only ones who got the word of God? No, the women did too. So they have the right, you know, like he's defending right. women in this case. I just want to make yeah. that very clear. Yeah. And, that, and, so, that, and, and that is a very defensible reading of the plain text of the earliest manuscripts of the Greek. Now, um, what the problem is, is when you translate it into Old Latin, uh, the, 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 one of the early, earliest Old Latin traditions, and it's not only in Old Latin, there's also Old Syriac, and, and there's Greek versions of this too. But in the Western manuscript tradition, they start to rearrange the verses. Mm. And so, uh, and there's a major textual displacement that's very much widespread in all of the early Western manuscripts. Where they take verses, they take verses thirty-four and thirty-five, and they move them to the very end of the epistle. So, if you read some of the oldest Western copies, which are written typically in Latin or in bilingual, uh, or, uh, or they tend to have sheltered these passages. These these misogynistic passages are moved so that they don't get refuted by verse 36. So verse 36 is now read immediately following verse 33b, right? Or something like that. Wow. So it doesn't, right? So it by, and it's it's a large textual displacement of this. And, and, and that is the version of the text that was writ, read by the, 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 the doctors of the early church who read it in conjunction with 1 Timothy chapter what is it is it 215 i forgive me i'm reading off the top of my head you know i don't yeah. have the the verses in front of me but the passage which i think is first timothy 2 15 around there where he says something similar there it's women need to listen to their husbands right but, it's, but the the grammar the the structure is whoever the 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 guy we call the pastor who's the forger who wrote first timothy and and called it a piece of paul's own writing is copying is is imitating this passage in first in a slightly different context and so then the late around the third fourth second third fourth century you start to get among those roman christians because remember roman law was women had to shut up in public assemblies the word church just means assembly it means like a gathering place like mm -hmm. where there's a bunch of men talking women aren't allowed to talk that is ancient Hellenistic custom, that is Roman law going back to Aristotle, pretty much. I mean, you have long tradition of women not being allowed to speak in public. So when these guys, these Corinthians say, women are, as the law says, women are not allowed to speak in church, they're not actually speaking about Jewish law. Right, right. They're talking these about Roman Gentile, law. These are Gentile converts in a Roman Greek colony in Corinth. In other words, the leaders are a few Jewish Christians. The Jews among them are like the elites. They're like a handful of Jews, like Priscilla, who's a woman, right? They're these the, these people that are Paul's people who are among their sort of like teachers. But the actual congregation is mostly Greco-Roman, not ethnically Jewish. So when they right. say, even as the law says, they're probably referring to Greek and Roman customs that are women aren't allowed to speak in public assemblies. And so what happens when, as the church gets, as the Christianity grows among the Romans and the Greeks, they have to kind of make it conform to sort of the legalistic norms of the society uh, at of large. The society yeah. at large. So you can see the pastoral forgery uh, that is first Timothy is one example. Now people debate about other, the other uh, pseudo Pauline epistles or whatever, right. the other Deuter Pauline, I think they're written by different authors. They're okay. not all the same author. Even the second epistle to Timothy, whether or not it, you know it's a forgery, doesn't matter to me so much because it's not written with the same agenda as First Timothy. I see the, right. the author of First Timothy and Titus is clearly a misogynist. Yeah. Clearly, somebody who is, you know, both of those epistles are about uh, are clear and unambiguous in saying women are not eligible to be teachers of men. Wow. Right. So, so this gets us into hot water real fast right. because what this does, and I'm, 
I'm going to try and I love your energy, by the way. You really do bring a, a very good rhetoric while you're communicating this. So this has been fun already. Um, one of the amazing things that comes to mind is when I had that conversation with M. David Litwa. And he has this wonderful book, The Evil Creator, where he starts right. to talk about Marcionism yep. and the Marcionites. And these guys were also practicing Pauline tradition. And he yes. had women with Pauline uh, traditions right. or they, they had women churches. So please tell us wh okay. what kind so, of connection. So, so let's get some Marcion in here or, or Marcion, depending on your pronunciation. Yeah. But he so let me be clear here. This issue about female ordination is not strictly orthodox versus heretical. Right. Well, so what it's very easy to say, well, the 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 heretics, the people who were outside the church, supported women's rights, while the orthodox, the people inside the official church, rejected them. The fact is, is just as today, this issue cross-cut conservative and liberal, orthodox and heretical traditions. That is, there were people on both sides of this argument in both churches. <laughs> and, but the but the issue of Mar Marcion's um, interpretation is important because it proves that there was an early interpretation of 1 Corinthians that included that passage in the canonical location that did not interpret it as meaning women couldn't actually speak. Right. In other words, Mark Marcion's text of 1 Corinthians is virtually identical to the to the canonical one. Right. He didn't have his version of 1 Corinthians wasn't majorly different. It was different maybe in a couple little areas and we only know that because it's been quoted by his enemies. And why were they quoting him? They they, they when when people like Tertullian of Carthage who was the person who advanced the the uh, women need to shut up view first and foremost when he cited Marcion, he said look your own text argues against you dude he's like he's like you say this is scripture but it's telling you the opposite of what you think it means what's he doing he's reading it his way but the point is, the fact that it was written the same way for the Marcionites means that they must have had a different way of reading it mm -hmm. but we don't have any direct evidence of what I call the quotation refutation hypothesis being the normative reading in the first three centuries of the church. We don't have like a church father citing this passage and saying, look, Paul is totally owning those dudes. Yeah. He's not, he, nobody cites it. Do you know why they don't cite it? Because it was inconsequential. Because it was like a it was like a settled dispute. So my my opinion is the reason why it didn't get to anyone's notice is because nobody like it was like an aside. It was like Oh, here's this little argument and it's addressed. But how do we know? We know that the earliest texts had it in the canonical location. And we know that the early fathers cited that epistle in general as evidence of female prophetic authority. So like when I think it's Clement of Alexandria, I'm pretty sure. No, no, not Clement of Alexandria. Oh, Irenaeus. Yeah. Clement of Alexandria is an egalitarian. He believes mm -hmm. that women have the right to speak in church. And he cites 1 Corinthians. Other early church fathers cite 1 Corinthians and do not support the idea that women aren't allowed to talk. Right. But Irenaeus actually says women are allowed to speak at church in one of his, I, I don't have the citation right in front of me. Right, right, right. But, you know, in other words, there are orthodox theologians of the first several centuries who endorse the idea that women are allowed to talk and that also cite 1 Corinthians in their writings, meaning they are aware of the text and they don't read it to mean the opposite of what. You see, I, oh, I get it. No, I, it's, yeah, I definitely it's do. A, I hope our... It's around the time that the Western manuscript tradition starts. It's right when the first old Latin rearrangements of the text where they start with where somebody moves that passage to the end of the epistle to shelter it from the criticism of verse 36. Right. Right? That's the first citation of the passage as an endorsement of female silence and subordination. And it's not done by itself, but it's done in conjunction with second Timothy. So like See, the that makes doctrine, you go. Yeah. This makes you wonder doctrine, what church father, uh, which who, you know, is it like pin the tail on the donkey at this point, who did it, who done it? Who wrote well, the these problem, other epistles that are obviously... I suspect it's anonymous. 
I suspect right, it's right. an anonymous person that we know the first, we know Tertullian is the first one who makes it explicit. Right. But he isn't beginning from nothing. Tertullian of Carthage is um Irenaeus seems like a potential candidate, is my well, yeah, but knows. Irenaeus and other so hold on. The early Orthodox tradition had women leadership. How do we know this? Okay. We know this. We know this not from text because we think that a lot. Uh, my, one of my um, colleagues, um, Ali Katuz, she has done amazing work with iconography and archaeology, where she has found liturgical iconography from the early churches shows that women were in leadership positions in the official church, not just in the in not the just Gnostics heritage. or Marcionites. Not or, just that, right. that 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 female leadership was widespread among Christians in general for centuries, and that they didn't stop being leaders like suddenly, like all of a sudden a rule gets passed and they're all like defrocked. No, it was a gradual like choking out. So in okay. other words, it was over centuries that women's leadership is in a long, slow decline, and by the the late medieval, early modern period, it's gone. Right, and then people look back and they project that male, that male only view of late of modern Christianity. They project that in their imaginations back onto the early church. Mm. But we can see from liturgical iconography, we can see women at the altar. We can see them holding Eucharistic paraphernalia. Right, we can see women depicted in leadership positions. So yes, there is definitely a concerted effort to change that that begins mm -hmm. early, but it isn't the majority, right? It isn't like it isn't like by fiat, it isn't like some authoritarian leader comes in and declares that women aren't allowed to be leaders anymore. It's more like an organic and messy process where the rise of male supremacists is one thing that happens that begins to happen. And it just so happens that because of the way we privilege the texts that agree with our views, mm -hmm. right? What most authors' texts don't survive, right? Most people, most writings are gone. Right. The ones that are preserved are the ones that later people decided were important. So if there was any early stuff that was clearly indicative of supporting women and not misogynistic right. exactly. or male supremacy, it, 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 then, well, it, doesn't, it doesn't even have to get suppressed. It just yeah. has to, it, it doesn't even have to be. An it just has to not, not be copied. Not get copied down. Literally. Exactly. Yeah. That's my point. So it's it. like, ah, eh, it's irrelevant. And it's irrelevant. just by that, they have in right. de facto, you know, Perfect. erased it from history in a way, in yeah. a way, but we have elements to know it was there. We have clear indications as you're pointing out, and it's just amazing how these people are all looking at the same letters <laughs> and they're coming right. away with different, but, now, different views. Now, part of that is Paul's fault. Right. Paul is really challenging to read. And Paul is so subtle and sarcastic. And it's not the only place. There's actually lots of places in the authentic epistles of Paul yeah. where you can read it two different ways. There's lots of places where you could say, <laughs> oh, I could see this or I could see this because he's he's too smart for his own good. And yeah. he's constantly he's constantly throwing people for a loop. And so there's quite a uh, there's a few places in his authentic epistles where you can say, is he taking is he is he is he kind of going, eh, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Or is he saying what he really you know, is it a clear, straightforward statement of doctrine or is he actually mocking his opponents? This is not the only time this happens. So, and one of the things that one of the things that makes the fake Paul, like First Timothy, so clear is that it's unambiguous, right? The, the yeah. author of First Timothy is saying, "I'm too. This is too confusing. Let's make Paul say that it's all yeah. clear and easy to understand. That way, <laughs> no, there won't be any more arguing over what Paul is actually saying here. Instead, we'll have an official, like endorsed." like stamp of approval on it. But this, okay. this makes me think of like scholarship with Paul within Judaism and Paul without, it's exactly why there's a problem here. Right. And that, and, and th let's go back. Cause I, I some people like Mar Mars, the, the later Marcionites were definitely anti Judaic in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. but the emergence of that sort of radical Paulinism is gradually out of a stream of Judaism. So I, I heard in your in interview with Dr. Um, the Western Australia University guy, the, the evil creator guy. Oh, Dr. yeah. M. David Litwa. Yeah. Yeah. He he 
you and he kind of danced around this issue was, was Paul himself more like a Marcionite or more like a Jewish Christian? I would say he was a little, that, that he was on the cusp between both. He's coming out of Jewish Christianity where they're saying that, um, the Jewish Christian position is that, you know, that Jewish law is important for salvation. Therefore, Gentiles are excluded. He's not actually denying the importance of the Jewish law for the Jews. Right. What is the, the new kind of new vision of Paul as a Jew is that he is extending grace to Gentiles. Right. Right. He's So in other words, he, his big tent doesn't eliminate Jewish Christianity. His big tent is saying, well, because you idolor, idolatrous Gentiles are messed up, <laughs> you can't, the law is going to destroy you. Right. The law protects Jews because Jews aren't idolaters. Jews follow, Jews are, are um, God's chosen people and are under the protection of the law. But the same law that protects Jews destroys Gentiles. See, this is you have this the grace is... of Jesus. So you see what I'm saying? So oh, say, yeah, this gets into Paul some stuff, the though. Cusp. Yeah, Later, it's... Marcionites take him into a non-Jewish direction. But right. by following his letters very, like, dogmatically. But the fact is, is that Paul was kind of trying to have his cake and eat it, too. He was That's really... what I was going to say. It's tough to pin him down because he sounds like in some of Paul's actual letters, he's like, I'm done with the Jews. They're not listening. They don't well, get it. He was you being, know? But he was complaining about being persecuted by everybody. Right. right. He's being persecuted by Gentiles, by Romans, by Jews. It's not, he, you know, so. It's tough. It's he, tough, though. It's it's not also, an easy. Yeah. He's also citing his own Pharisee training as being his right. bad, his badge of honor. I mean, mm-hmm. why is he, why is he an authority? Why is, why should you trust what he says? Because he studied with, these people themselves he know he's an expert on the torah right? right you know what i mean it's not like he's saying my expertise doesn't matter he's not you know what i mean his right he's talking about the same god right he's yeah, just yeah. you see what i'm saying so yeah. it, you're right i mean it's more social and i mean look at the way the way i mean acts is written by somebody who was traditionally thought of as one of paul's disciples but acts is obviously a later thing yeah but acts portrays the early christians closely aligned with the Pharisees. Yeah. Right? Because the Pharisees are the ones who come, when the Sadducees are attacking Christians, the Pharisees who are Jews, not Christians, are defending them. And yeah. who is Paul? Paul is the only self-identified Pharisee in the in at, at that stage in history. Right? He is like the first person on record to come to come on to write in his own hand and say, I I am a Pharisee by training. Right. So in other right. words, Really, when you want to study the early Pharisees, who do you look at? You look at Paul. He's he's the he's the primary one of the primary sources for that. So the point is, is the, what were the Pharisees? The Pharisees believed in resurrection of the dead, mm-hmm. so they were like the Christians in a lot of sense. They didn't necessarily believe that Jesus was the Messiah, so that was the why Matthew had such a hard time with Pharisees. But the fact is, is that the Pharisees were in most ways cosmopolitan, open-minded. They didn't, they were not exactly, you know, fundamentalists. We'll put it that way. Right. The Sadducees were kind of your fundamentalist in a sense of like, but we're sticking to this, even though they didn't right. believe in a, re- in a resurrection, they were very old school, you yeah. know, what we would they had call. Like small, they, had, they, had, they had a more narrower canon that was like based on the Torah. They were Torah purists. Yeah. yeah. But, so, yeah. but I, anyway, that's yeah. not my expertise. I, I don't want to get it. I get I it. Go, this is just fun. Yeah, I get it. I don't want to go off too much on things that I am not really well versed in. But I let's just say that I don't feel the need to pigeonhole Paul as being more or less Jewish. He's clearly because at the time that he's doing these, that he's debating about this stuff um, with other believers in his subsect, mm-hmm. he is um, things are very much in flux. And remember, we also sometimes think what we project post temple judaism back onto paul this was before the temple was destroyed this was before the talmud was written down right right? and all those jewish oral laws had yet to come into existence as a as the formalized documents that we know and so when we try to judge paul against the the ideology of later jews doesn't really work it's it's anachronistic because those people were also trying to get by in a Roman world, right? Yeah. Like the entire formation of rabbinical Judaism, on the one hand, it 
goes back to to Hebrew and to traditionalist traditionalist understandings in some ways. But on the other hand, it's very pro Roman, right? The or the right. early the early rabbis were like, we we're we're good citizens. We're not going to rock the boat. So in many ways, you know what I mean. I, I'm just saying mm-hmm. that you can't that understanding apocalyptic Judaism requires that you throw out a lot of assumptions about the, that that we have baked into us from the last 1800 years of history of Christianity and right. and Judaism as separate religions. At the time Paul was writing, there wasn't the word Christian didn't exist. Right. That was that that appears in like Luke in in Luke Acts, right? You don't Paul didn't say I am a Christian, you are Jews. He was talking to God-fearing Gentiles yeah. and trying to extend to them the um the grace of the God that he believed in, which came from his Jew, you know, in other words, yeah. some people question whether even Paul actually converted to anything, right? Is he does he actually convert? Or is he just kind of changing his orientation within Judaism at a time before? Um, yeah. Anyway, so it's I'm a, getting, yeah. No, this is interesting. interesting though. I go on yeah. tangents. It's okay. I, I, I love it. So okay, final words, and then I want our audience to obviously check you out. Any of your stuff that you might have, uh, if you've got any links, we could put it down in the description. Okay. Cool to- so um, I uh, I can, but the, unfortunately, this stuff that I'm talking to you with about has. has I have yet to publish it. So why don't I withhold those links for now? I mean, at some point when I get like a better package, that's because, because I could give you links. Yeah. yeah, It wouldn't be relevant Mm because I've, I've done too many other things. So this is, like I said, this is something that I'm getting into recently. Okay. And so I want to be, um, once I get the, the article that this, uh, talk is based on published and it will be published. I'm hopefully where I've uh, first attempted to publish it, but, if not, then somewhere, and I will provide you with all that uh, okay. in, in due course. And I can certainly give you my faculty webpage, but that's not, you know, that's that's just pretty bare bones. Yeah, no, no, no. I totally, totally, whenever you're ready, give it to me. I'll let the audience know. I'm sure a lot of people watching this are, are enjoying it. And there's so many questions I'd have. I think we should do more here in the future just to hang out, yeah. discussion, speculate yeah. together a little too. Uh, I have no problem doing that. I know academics don't really like to do that uh, without – they don't like speculating so much, but to be honest with you, I feel like at the end of the day, it is oftentimes a guessing game and we just don't right. have sufficient evidence uh, to go, oh, we know that this is what it is sometimes and not always. But and when it is that, you know, playing that little rabbit trail, OK, if this, then what draws the conclusions based on that? So if that is the case, where can that lead us? And having fun doing that, it sounds like you've done quite a bit of that in your own, you know, just thinking through these things. So I really enjoyed this. Yeah. And I'm, and I think that dialogue between people who disagree is often more productive than dialogue with other people who think like you. So I am, I'm definitely, uh, that's why, why I respected your podcast enough to reach out to you in this case is because I see you talking with people (laughs) with really, really different ideas from each other in a way that I think is really cool. And I hope that you, I wish you a lot of success in, in your work. Well, thank you. It's going to continue to happen. People want to see a debate all the time. And I'm like, hold on, hold on. I do host debates. Don't get me wrong. They're usually very professional, but at the end of the day, I feel like debates are like football teams. You go into the, to the game, rooting your side on, you're looking for your side to win. You're not really looking at this going, here's raw data from two different sides just digest and it's really for entertainment more than it is for academic research and pursuit and for me i'm more interested in actual pursuit because i don't know that's it's just me i've been into the whole watching debates in the past and i remember picking my side as a christian a fundamentalist christian and then later on the same guy i used to think was my enemy and i didn't like i actually heard what he was actually saying I guess you could say I actually listened to what he said and I was able to take it in and go, whoa, that's actually far better than what I was used. I used to think the other guy had it and I figured out how to kind of balance some of these things. I think where a lot of people are coming from oftentimes is genuine and it's sincere, but at the same time, the argumentation at the end of the day still collapsed. But anyway, rabbiting off, I really hope that you'll come back. Let's do this again. Let's talk deeper into Paul and, and different ideas you might have. And 
Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I sort of scratched the surface and a number of the, uh, the, the uh, deeper issues we have yet to get to. And I would love to have another opportunity, maybe after the publication, we'll, we'll schedule something then. Absolutely. That Thank sounds you. good. And where I can find the things we missed. Let's do it. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It's Thank you so much. Here, and uh, I will continue to follow your podcast. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hold on one second. And ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, we are Myth Vision.